Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Thanks again for stopping by. I apologise for my absence, but I'll tell you all about that. I was down in Mombasa. And I didn't realise this morning that I was wearing this particular tie, which is, as you can see, I think rather apt for today's happy Valentine's Day. And I wish you all a happy Valentine's Day. Um, looking, I'm looking forward to hosting Charles Island. Uh, that's a week on Saturday at the Intercontinental. Um, I went to the results, the first half results this morning, and I'll come to that in a second. Um, I did an interview late last year with him. If you get a chance to have a look, that link is on Rich Wrap-Ups and my favourite photo of all, which was at that Johnny Walker party when I thought he, I caught him in a very good mood, I must admit. Well, it was rather Johnny. Um, and if you haven't seen my interview with MG Vasanji, please do, because being down at the coast, on the Swahili coast, it was, of course, very... Um, apt. He's writing about that culture that existed on that coastline. Um, I came across uh, this uh, by Jeff Koons, and uh, I think it's apt for Valentine's Day. So again, happy Valentine's Day. And uh, one from my tie as well, as you can see. Um, I, got, I spent the night uh, at Leopard Beach, which I hadn't stayed at before, in Diani. Um, and uh, early in the morning, uh, Nishet said to me, have you been in the sea? And I always love to go in it, but it was very, very still. I'll put up a photograph of the sea. And its depth was about that, you know, a couple of inches. So it's very difficult to swim in at that time. But I managed to have a little swim, and I'm grateful for that. And it's so beautiful down there, I must admit. And then I wanted to put up another photograph as we were coming down to land at 35,000 feet outside Nairobi. It was just full of cloud. This is apparently this weather system off Mozambique which has brought these extraordinary unseasonal rains and it thoroughly confused me because the seasons were something you could rely on and today you know, I, I, I don't know um, what's going on because I mean we normally never get rains at this time of year and Diana itself was actually quite cool for this time. Political reflections, I still think this is one of the most powerful quotations that I've ever come across and it's in 1984 and, it, and in it, George Orwell wrote, Who controls the past controls the future. Who controls the present controls the past. I think that's still extremely powerful. I came across this photograph, Laboratory of the Future by Man Ray. And, uh, it sort of caught my attention. Coming to the currency markets, the euro is at around 137 and uh, has had a good recovery. Dollar index. You know, I wasn't confident about it rallying beyond that level. We're now nearly a full point uh, below that level I previously spoke about. We're at 80.18, three-week lows against uh, major currencies. Soft data coming out of the U.S. Um, uh, so that, you know, I think might just have had a soft patch. I don't think we're talking about any sort of breakdown in the recovery um, yet. Japanese yen 101.84, Swiss franc 0.8922. The pound was the standout, 166.62, 167 before I went to do the podcast, actually. Um, this is the highest in nearly three years, and it's rallied more than 1.5% this week. And I'll come back to that article I wrote when I visited London, and I was struck by, this, by the underlying strength of the, of the recovery that I, that I was witnessing then. Aussie 0.8994, India rupee 62.29, South Korean one ten sixty three seventy. the real back below 240, 239.38, Egyptian pound 696.19, and the South African rand 11.0106. Dollar index, I'll put up a three-month chart of that, 80.18 last. And uh, as I said, you know, I wasn't a buyer of the rally this year for some reason. I don't know why, it was more intuition, I think. Um, but uh, I think, you know, the bulls are going to be, um, you know, distressed again because they're not getting any traction. Euro dollar 136.99 and uh, uh, a fellow from BNP saying, you know, after ECB president Mario Draghi specifically pointed to Q4 GDP as a key piece of incoming evidence on the economy, the report, the report should be watched closely today. And that was written yesterday. And then when you go and look... Um, uh, at the data, um, you will notice that actually, you know, the, the uh, recovery in the in the in Europe um, uh, is is gaining more traction. Uh, France grew 0.3 percent, Germany 0.4, I think, 
um, and those were stronger numbers than the market had priced in. Put up a three-month chart of the dollar yen, which is probably the strongest currency of the major developed currencies in 2014, but remember it had been sold off badly into year-end. Sterling, as I said, near three three year highs. I'll put up a chart of that. And you know, I wrote on the twelfth of August when this when this uh, uh, when cable was at one fifty three. And I said, how does an investor play this recovery? I think you need to be net long sterling. Um, I reckon there is an outside chance that UK property, which is projected to rally twenty five percent over five years, achieves that in twenty four or thirty months. And I think that's proven to be correct. I like looking for narratives that are embedded and entrenched and where I can see an inflection point. And I think uh, the United Kingdom, Europe and the US have inflected. And I said, watch closely how the narrative starts changing. And I was basically saying, you know, that you need to be net long sterling. I like this headline that you probably remember Pan Am, Woolworths, Mr. Donut. All these names, whether iconic or obscure, are proof that many old brands never die. They're just reborn, living on in distant corners of the globe. Call them zombie brands. Hardly zombie when they're coming back. It's quite interesting, actually, you know, how some brands died in the U.S. but actually gained tremendous uh, uh, um, uh, momentum in other places. Pan Am is coming back. Mr. Donut is huge in Japan, apparently. I didn't know that. Gold, I'll put up a one-year chart. Now, this has bought me off. 1309.885, biggest weekly advance since October. Um, has traded above the 100-day moving average since February 10. Heading for a close above the 200-day moving average for the first time since February 2013. This week alone, it's up 3.4%. I, for one, did not expect such a strong start to 2014, and I'm seriously tempted now to get quite short of these levels. Um, however, uh, I won't do that just yet. Newcrest, Mi Newcrest Mining Limited CEO's girls' rally has been driven in part by very, very strong physical demand. That was great one. Crude oil back below 100, you know my thoughts on that. I think this is probably an outstanding opportunity. And I was going to write, I fa fancied betting the house on it, but given it took me seven years to get the house finished, I'm not going to bet it. Not this time, anyway. I did once. The very day that uh, President Bush went on, I think it was the USS Abraham Lincoln, and said, uh, you know, something about it all being over in Iraq. And uh, the oil price collapsed. I bought it then and it never went down to that level again, I think, if you look back on, on a long-term chart. Sub-Saharan Africa, the South African oil shares up 0.07% in 2014, back in positive territory. The dollar round, I'll put up a three-month chart, we're back around the 11 area. I mean, it, the dollar continues to sell off. I think the rand, which has been a serious underperformer, could be a serious outperformer um, in the near term if that continues. Zuma calls for South Africa mining stability as he warns on RAND. South African President Jacob Zuma called for stability in the mining industry and an end to violent strikes as he warned about significant risks to inflation because of a weakening RAND. Um, Zuma said in the State of the Nation a speech to Parliament in Cape Town, labor union leaders and mining companies need to ensure their actions result in limited job losses he said south africa has faced an upsurge in violent protests this year labor strikes have shut platinum mines and undermined growth in africa's largest economy at least 10 people have died since the beginning of the year 94 protests in this but that's a sharp spike by the way protests by shantytown residents to demand jobs and improved living conditions Interesting what he said, actually. The dominant narrative in the case of the protests in South Africa has been to attribute them to alleged failures of government. However, the protests are not simply the result of failures of government, government but also of the success in delivering basic services. When 95% of households have access to water, the 5% who still need to be provided for feel they cannot wait a moment longer. The rand has lost more than a fifth of its value against the dollar in the past year. Um, and of course, inflation is now 5.4% in December, and then the central bank pushed up rates. Nothing as dramatic as the Turks, for example. Two decades after the end of apartheid in 1994, support for the ruling ANC is waning, 
with a recent opinion poll showing the party may win less than 60% of the vote. And that was my prediction, I think, a few weeks ago, and I think it will be some way below 60 in my opinion. Uh, in no way can we, can, can we have conflict that destroys the economy, Zuma said. Um, so it's going to be interesting times indeed. Of course, I think you'll have a plurality of votes, but I think you know they're going to be below 60% in my view. And I think Julius Malema, by the way, has got some incredible title on Twitter as economic freedom fighters or something or other. Um, he's really a lightning rod and will consolidate the protest vote. The Egyptian pound was last at 696. The Egyptian stock market up 11.98% uh, this year. And uh, if you account for currency, then it's the best performing stock market. Rebounded really hard. As I said some time ago, if the equity markets had a vote, LCC is a shoe in. Nigeria all shared down 4.71% this year and fell quite sharply yesterday, 2.24%. The Ghana Stock Exchange is now, uh, in absolute terms, the best performing stock market in Africa, up 13%, but you've had about 5% of currency slippage, which therefore puts Egypt on top. At least six dead in car bomb attack at Mogadishu Airport. At least six people, most of them civilians, died in the car bomb explosion. A Shabab spokesman claimed a number of foreigners were among the dead. This was an operation carried out by Shabab. It was a brother who took a sacrificial act to defend the people of Somalia. Shabab military spokesman Sheikh Abdulaziz Abu Musab told the AF. Target was a UN convoy, according to our report. Several invaders have been killed. Um, uh, African Union troops, are obviously from Uganda, Kenya, Burundi, have recaptured every major insurgent bastion, um, and they're trying to support the government in Mogadishu. But you know, there was a lot of optimism. Do you remember when, at the time of uh, the London conference, David Cameron gave it a big push? Um, but a string of devastating Shabab attacks against foreign and government targets have shattered hopes of a rebirth for the war-ravaged capital. And I think it's really turned a little bit uh, messy over there, and I don't see how it's going to be settled down. And of course, you know, we're suffering contamination because we've got big Muslim communities feeling very estranged, um, uh, and especially down the coast again, where I drove in around Likoni and could see the Pani Sea Kenya everywhere. And uh, there's quite a lot of unhappiness. And, uh, I, I think you know one's got to work out a better strategy for dealing with that than our current one, which is you know taking a hammer to the situation. East African breweries reported first half profit after tax up four percent. Um, revenue was up four. Uh, revenue was up four percent. Cost of sales down one percent. Gross profit up nine percent. Um, Admin expenses up 26%, but I think you know they're trying to digest that Serengeti Brewery's purchase. We always knew it'd be a little bit untidy, and I think that's what caused that. Um, profit before tax 6.084 billion, up 5%. Profit after tax up 4% at 4.161 billion. Earnings per share up 505% at 4 shillings 99 cents. Interim dividend unchanged at 150. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second, but just give you some other key points. Kenya was strong. Uh, we'll get back to Senator in a minute, where volumes collapsed 85%. That was on <coughs> the introduction of excise duty. And what it tells you is that, you know, uh, you cannot always assume that you can just tax something. And if the government has had, a, had an expectation that we get 6.2 billion shillings of tax and they've got nothing. It's a negative return because the consumption has collapsed. It's down 85%. And on a volume basis, that was a big part of the ABL's um, business. Um, but bear in mind, I think, you know, the market had priced in that practically completely. And uh, therefore, it pushed the share to a December 2012 low. I think it's overdue a big rebound from here because I think these numbers were far better than the street expected. Interestingly, Uganda, very strong, up 17%. And looking at other companies in Uganda, they actually hit a weak spot in there. So that was interesting. Tanzania, however, softer, down 11%. But I think that's all around, you know, absorbing Serengeti, getting put on the system, you know, basically industrializing that business. And I think that will take a little bit longer. International exports business, which is sort of DRC in South Sudan, 
obviously got, took a hit, but revenue still grew 6%, and they've now got a depot in Cuba, which uh, Charles was uh, keen to say has not been damaged and is, is there. Um, and then, uh, other than that, let me just, I'll put up a, an image of the senator volumes, and you can see the collapse down 85%. And that's what was concerning the market. I think, you know, basically it's a known, known. we know what's happened. Um, they've had a little fillip in, in terms of very low cost, um, what they call emerging spirits as a counterweight, but still they took a big bite out of the business. You would have seen double digit growth without what happened in the Senate. In the Senate, I'll put another diagram with the earnings data, and I, for one, think that they beat expectations. Another diagram of by country breakdown, you can see Kenya was strong, Uganda was strong. Um, interestingly, Tusker up 17%. That's a very strong performance. Guinness up 24%. Uh, that's, those are big brands doing big things. I think that's good. Uh, premium and mainstream uh, data. Reserve spirits up 50%. Uh, emerging spirits, triple digit gain. That, some of that was because people were squeezed out of Senator. But still great numbers. You know, the Uganda plus 17%. I'll put up a photograph of Charles just before he started speaking and told me not to photograph him as a joke. Um, so I thought these were much better results than many expected, given the excise duty correlated senator slump. Uh, Uganda was a standout, Tanzania minus 11, but we always knew there would be some work to be done there. Reserve spirits up 50, that's 50%, that's big. That speaks to the emerging middle class. Emerging spirits up more than 100%. Interestingly, cost of borrowing was lower, notwithstanding some more, notwithstanding some more bulking up but of borrowing, actually. So that speaks to the, the better structure of interest rates. Um, and uh, on balance, I think those were far better results than the market expected. I know we're on change at 249, but I can see that share price rallying about 10, 15% because I think it become way too bearish on concerns of that sentiment. I'm going to put up a photograph of the cabinet secretary Najib Balala, Joe Schwartz, and Colin, of base resources, getting ready with their helmets on. I couldn't resist it. I told them, please stop them, take a photo. Um, getting ready to load the first Ilmenite exports from Kenya, and it's going to China. And congratulations to all those photos. I got to know them about two and a half years ago. Tim came and did a mind speak, and I've watched that journey. He's been relentlessly determined, and I commend him. I really do because it's a first-class facility. And when you drive around Laconia, it's pretty rough. And suddenly you come to this 21st century thing, they've got that. Um, uh, the consignment is being loaded as we speak onto the MV African Eagle at the company's 2.5 billion shilling port facility at Laconia mainland. Najib Balala said the project is historic, having taken 18 years before the realization of the first export. Um, Australian High Commissioner Jeff Tooth, um, who had his armoured vehicle brought down specially to, uh, to meet him at the airport, drive him around, and then the fellow had to come back again. You know, I think even the British High Commission is under a similar restriction. I mean, it's been a little bit unsettled down there, I'm afraid. I'll put up a photograph of the MV African Eagle. Um, also, uh, then mention an article I came across talking about government seeking to deploy a 100 days rapid results initiative on fighting the crime wave in Kenya. And uh, definitely, anecdotally, everyone's uh, very concerned about that. Total number of criminal cases reported to the police fell 8% between January and November 2013, but violent offences, including murder, robbery, rape, surged between 11 and 22% excellent article in Bloomberg looking at what's going on. Um, uh, Kenyan security agencies are viewed by the public as ineffective and corrupt and impunity is a problem. Rising insecurity of late um, and uh, a fellow who's CEO of Integrated Fire and Safety Solutions Limited, the security company, said he escaped and attempted carjacking on a busy highway in the capital last month as he was driving his wife, children and another family to dinner. There are concerns, and I think there are not so many people going out anymore. Kenya police break up a protest accuse U.S. of funding activists. Kenya police crack down on the anti-corruption protest in the streets of Nairobi Thursday after accusing the U.S. government of funding political activists. Hoisting giant foam babies, protesters demonstrated against leaders they say behave like children, a state they refer to as Kenya's diaper mentality. 
Kenyan authorities had earlier banned the protest, citing security concerns and the threat of terrorism. Kenyan officials also accused the, accused the US aid agency USAID of funding political activists in an effort to topple the Kenyan government. Not good. I think domestically it might play well to the party's base, but I think internationally this kind of stuff really does not uh, play well. Protest leader and political activist Boniface Mwangi deflected the accusations. What are they afraid of? The government has the intelligence, the military, they have control over the state apparatus. So if they want to claim that I'm being funded, then they would, should say they should say who's funding me. Name names. I can't topple the government on my own. But they're afraid of what is actually a popular uprising by the people who are disadvantaged, he said. Um, he has a point. Kenya shilling 86.344. The Nairobi all shares plus 0.78% in 2014, but uh, you know, looks well supported at these levels. NSE 20 is down 1.77%. Um, Kenya Airways is set to receive the Boeing 787 Dreamliner on April the 4th, and that will be a transformative moment for the airlines. They're then going to get a bunch of new planes, fuel efficiency, which costs them about half a billion dollars. They're going to slice 20% of that. That's nearly a hundred million dollars of PL right there. And uh, it's, it will be a, a very transformative for the earnings. Um, there's a link for the Mindspeak session with Dr. Titus Naikuni. Please have a look at that. It was, it was a great success. He had a pro deep philosophy. Obviously, sort of very Maasai, but interesting. It made a lot of sense. High Court is allowing CFC Stanbic to take over Karaturi. Karaturi is the people who took about 300,000 hectares from the Ethiopian government. Um, this is not going to be the right signal. I'll put up a photograph of flower farm workers, and there's been a problem there for a while, blocking the road to demand payment for four months' outstanding wages. I'm heading down now on Sunday for Mr. Cunningham Reed's funeral. Sorry about that, I must admit. Um, leaders and delegates from 46 countries have pledged to fight the £12 billion illegal wildlife trade together for the first time. This was the conference in London, watershed moment. It's how it's been called. Foreign Secretary William Hague, this will show the criminals that there are no weak links and they will then, that they will suffer serious consequences if they continue their crimes. One key focus was the plight of the African elephant. 50,000 are slaughtered each year to fuel the growing ivory trade, driven in particular by demand from China. That note, I shall end my podcast with those elephants crossing the Galana River, seen on Christmas Day in Sabo East. And once again, thank you for stopping by. It's appreciated.